Throughout the history of any science, but paleontology in particular, you will find an immense array of bizarre ideas and hypotheses. Many of them have gone out with the times, while some still cling on for dear life, and yet others remain prescient. One of the many that have fallen by the wayside is the hypothesis proposed by a few people but illustrated by John McLaughlin in the 1970s. This hypothesis posits that the horned dinosaurs, the Ceratopsians, were far more mammalian in their soft tissues than is currently thought. Aside from those intimidating horns, one of the biggest, best, most charismatic features of the Ceratopsian dinosaurs is the bony frill jutting out of the back of the skull. These frills are made up of bones from the back and roof of the skull. In your average animals, these holes are where muscles, tendons, fat, and more attach and run through inside the skull, down to the jaws and mouth. The frill of the Ceratopsians is therefore an important, permanent part of the entire skull and moves wherever it moves its head. To compensate for the possible immobility of the head as a whole, Ceratopsians had a ball joint attaching the back of the skull to their necks, which was so spheroidal that their heads could be thrown around in all directions with ease. Dip the snout all the way to the ground, throw the head side to side, and tilt the head upwards until the frill touched the shoulders. The other hallmark of the frill is the bony decorations lining the edges, folding over the front or lining the middle bridge of the bone. Since the frills are an extended part of the skull that usually holds a bunch of muscle in other animals, surely it would have done the same in Ceratopsians. Since the frill had two enormous openings where jaw musculature usually exits and roots itself into the top of the skull, this must be how it worked, right? Since the openings on the top of the skull in Ceratopsians are stretched so much to create the frill, could it be a hyper-specialized structure to allow these animals extremely long jaw muscles for an immensely strong bite force, perhaps exceeding the Tyrant Lizard King or the Mighty Megalodon? Well, no. But this was an hypothesis proposed by a few authors up until the 1970s. The extent of musculature in the frill differed from author to author, with some just anchoring into the bottom of the frill openings, and others extending right across the frill to the rear margin. The most famous example of this was the work of paleoartist John McLaughlin. He illustrated the most extreme hypothesis for frill muscles in the Ronald Paul Rotkovich written 1976 Dinosaurs of the Southwest and two subsequent McLaughlin books, the 1979 Archosauria, A New Look at the Old Dinosaurs, and the 1981 The Tree of Animal Life, A Tale of Changing Forms and Fortunes. Aside from Ceratopsian speculative biology, all of his books also cover just about everything considered extreme for dinosaur reconstructions at the time, utilizing the true spirit of the dinosaur renaissance. These books include fuzzy feathered theropods, slender land-loving sauropods, and gazelle-like ornithopods. For Ceratopsians, McLaughlin suggested large jaw muscles covered the entire surface of a Ceratopsian's frill and stretched through the holes and across the frill to the neck and back. As a result, his Ceratopsians are decked out in big, meaty neck humps, reminiscent of modern bison and cattle. He did this with Triceratops, Chasmosaurus, Taurosaurus, Styracosaurus, Cetacosaurus, and Protoceratops. This reconstruction of Ceratopsian frill muscles was replicated in another paleontological tome, David Lambert's 1983 Collins Guide to Dinosaurs. Paleontologist Dr. Peter Dodson. Dodson, Dodson, we've got Dodson here! See, nobody cares. Wrote about this idea in his 1996 The Horned Dinosaurs. Dodson attacked the basis for the idea that McLaughlin took and ran with, that there could have been huge amounts of muscle or soft tissue across the front of the Ceratopsian frill. Dodson writes that the grandfather of the dinosaur renaissance, Dr. John Ostrom, argued that the horned dinosaurs had obnoxiously large jaw muscles. 
The framework for those muscles was the frill. Interestingly, this idea didn't begin with Ostrom or Dodson, but it goes all the way back to the 1908 work of Richard Lull with the skulls of Triceratops. It cropped up again in W.D. Matthews' 1915 Dinosaurs for the American Museum of Natural History with this lovely chunky Triceratops illustration. In the 1935 work of L.S. Russell and Chasmosaurus, and when George Haas did work on Protoceratops in 1955. Dodson notes that one big problem here is having a giant mess of flesh on the surface of the frill. This would give the animals a really great target for predators to slice through. Dodson notes that you might think even having frills that large and with huge holes, as in most Ceratopsians, would also be a good predator target, making it a bad defense mechanism all around. In subsequent decades, the idea of the Ceratopsian frill being primarily for display has gained ground, so it didn't really matter if it was a target. Dodson also explained that animals don't inherently need extremely long jaw muscles for a strong bite. No successful mammalian or reptilian herbivore alive today has jaw muscles that could reach the proposed 1.5 meters of this hypothesis. In fact, as Dodson writes, few of these animals have muscles even a third of that length. Length has nothing to do with the power of the muscles. It's all about girth, not length, fellas. Muscle strength is increased with an increase in muscle fibers. Bigger or wider muscles do impart more strength, which is why jaw muscles are quite short. In animals with powerful bites, the muscles visibly bulge out of the head. Observe the elephant, pit bull, or hyena. Dodson's final nail in the giant frill muscle coffin centered around bone textures. In his own words, We know from comparative anatomy that in a region where a muscle originates or where it passes by, the bone surface is smooth, often slippery. In a living animal, by contrast, where the bone surface is textured with grooves for blood vessels or pitted, tough skin adheres to the bone, and there is no muscle underneath the skin. He went on to note that the frill bones in all ceratopsians don't preserve a surface texture consistent with bones covered in muscles. Early short-frilled ceratopsians had smooth bone around the very tiny shelves sticking out of their skulls, but the advanced ceratopsians had roughly textured bone. Even one of the smoothest frilled horned dinosaurs, Triceratops, still had quite rough textures throughout much of the frill. If there were any muscles on the frill, which there probably were, they were restricted more to the areas immediately around the bottom margin of the frill holes, called supratemporal fenestrae. So, not like this, and more like these. Dodson already laid out the proof that muscles didn't stretch that far across the frill, but having a huge muscular hump would also immobilize, or nearly immobilize, the head and neck into one position. If the skull was immobilized in a muscular hump, then why did the skull have such a spherical mobile joint? It doesn't make sense. The math ain't mathin'. To make matters worse for the hump hypothesis, if the head and neck were restricted, then why would they also have these spines, scallops, and knobs sticking out of the frill's margin? They'd be much less visible or impressive if semi-buried in flesh. Additionally, there were also a good handful of chasmosaurian ceratopsians with truly gigantic frills, critters like Pentaceratops, Titanoceratops, Taurosaurus, and Chasmosaurus had massive frills so long and steep that McLaughlin's proposed muscular covering would look like this. Highly impractical. Many modern reptiles indeed sport bony frills connected to the neck and torso via webs of skin. However, they differ from the horned dinosaurs because they are narrow, bendable sheets. Some species of chameleons have wide ceratopsian-like frills unconnected to the animal's back. Sure, lizards aren't a great phylogenetic comparison to ceratopsians, but physically attaching the head to the torso for better jaw muscles doesn't seem to be something biologically plausible. Additionally, if it were advantageous to have giant elongated muscles attaching the head to the body, then chameleons would probably have the same convergently evolved adaptations, yet they don't. It's uncertain whether McLaughlin's arguably eccentric take on this muscular idea was ever taken seriously by the paleontological community at large, and it seems it wasn't considering there aren't many published references to it, but it still has value. 
unorthodox ideas of prehistoric animals shouldn't warrant heartless aristocratic scorn. Even if they're loony, they also shouldn't be outright ignored, which is the prevailing reaction to unorthodox ideas. As paleontologist Dr. Darren Nash notes, these ideas are valuable for broadening perspectives on extinct animals as a whole and lessening dogmatic or traditional ideas of how things ought to be. It's an example of thinking outside the box. Sometimes you get crazy stuff like bison dinos. Other times you get a plausible and possible display structure, but with no hard data to back it up. McLaughlin's Ceratopsians offer a teaching moment. It's clear that people have a tendency to make Ceratopsians up as these rhino or ungulate-like animals. A paleoart meme carried over from artist to artist is to unconsciously assume these horned dinosaurs, or many high-spined quadrupedal dinosaurs, evolved humped backs akin to the shoulder humps of bison. As Dr. Darren Nash pointed out in his blog on humped ceratopsians, one of these paleoart memes lies in Dougal Dixon's 1988 speculative evolution book, The New Dinosaurs. The monocorn is a herd-dwelling grazer that evolved from Cretaceous horned dinosaurs to carry a hefty keratin-covered face and skull shield, a shaggy neck beard, and straps of enormous shoulder muscles attached to elongated spines sticking out of the back vertebrae. The tendency for recreating high shoulder humps also appears in real dinosaurs. Paleontologist Dr. Jack Bailey wrote a 1997 paper on the possibility that high-spined dinosaurs, namely Oranosaurus and Spinosaurus, may have had humps instead of sails. Bailey argued that these dinosaurs' neural spines were much wider than animals traditionally thought to carry sails, like Dimetrodon and Adaphosaurus. He also suggested they weren't as tall as those on the synapsid sail bearers. They were too similar to tall-spined mammals. Bailey argued these tall neural spines in dinosaurs were attachment sites for large muscles and ligaments to form a broad hump. To better illustrate this hypothesis, R. E. Johnson provided some paleoart of humped dinosaurs. Unlike McLaughlin's Ceratopsians, this hump idea wasn't outright thrown in the trash. It became part of the debate over what high-spined dinosaurs used their ridges for. This also wasn't the first time a buffalo back to reconstruction was thought up. The Megalosaurus of Crystal Palace Park, constructed by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins in the 1850s, was also given a high-humped back. Dr. Darren Nash hypothesized this may have been due to the fossils of Altispinax, a moderately spined set of vertebrae belonging to some dubious theropod. This turned out to be unfounded, and the hump of the Megalosaurus was a coincidence. It proves people have been thinking about the hump idea for a very long time. How much water does a high-backed condition hold for the dinosaurs? Dinosaurs are much heavier in their back ends, hips, tails, and thighs. Mammals, on the other hand, tend to be heavier in their front. Taking birds, crocodilians, lizards, and fossil data into account, dinosaurs tend to store their fat in their rear. It's unlikely they would have stored fat on their backs or shoulders since it's a mammal-centric feature. If dinosaurs were to evolve, a fatty hump would likely place over the hips and base of the tail, as seen with the bony shark's fin of Concavenator, not the body-length sail of Spinosaurus. Some dinosaurs have been targeted as good candidates for a mammalian high back. Some researchers, namely paleoartist Greg Paul, have pointed to the elevated shoulder and thoracic areas as indicative of a high-backed condition. Paul specifically pointed this out in brachiosaurid sauropods and the chasmosaurs. However, this doesn't hold up to simple observations. Take a look at a few chasmosaur fossils and skeletal mounts, and it's unclear if their vertebral spines were high enough to even be considered a high back. The highest spines show up at about the midpoint of the spine, not the shoulders. So if a ceratopsian were to have the speculative shoulder hump proposed by McLaughlin, it would be far more probable to place it over the middle to end of the back or hips. Inspiration for dinosaur reconstructions may have gone to mammalian. The neural shoulder spines of mammals are generally an adaptation for grazing in wide open areas. They're linked to the rocking gait of mammals, like horses and bison, which is efficient for moving around prairies and grazing. There were once vast fern prairies during the Jurassic period, but the advanced ceratopsians, like the centrosaurs and chasmosaurs, didn't come onto the scene until the Cretaceous period. 
grasses first appeared in the Cretaceous period, with some tantalizing evidence of appearing even earlier. However, they didn't seem to have blanketed the ground the same way they do today. Therefore, though grasses existed, they likely wouldn't have formed wide open grasslands. So dinosaurs never got the chance to adapt to these biomes, making a shoulder hump unlikely. Most reptiles with high spines, like chameleons, have a tendency for thin sails or ridges rather than thick, meaty humps. The wide neural spines of Spinosaurus and Aranosaurus are shaped more like those of a lizard than those of a bison. Make sure to check out my video on Bailey's work on Spinosaurus humps with a link in the description and comment section below. Dinosaurs are generally more prone to evolve tall midline ridges and crests as seen in many lineages. Ceratosaurids, Spinosaurids, Therizinosaurs, Diplodocids, and more. And that is McLaughlin Ceratopsians. Unlike some weird mistakes in paleontologic history, this one has a long history with many contributions. I'm indebted to Darren Nash, Peter Dodson, and Jack Bailey for the major parts they played in the history of this subject. They were huge and very important references for this video. What do you think of the thick-necked Ceratopsians? Let me know in the comment section below. What do you think we are getting equally wrong today? For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.